but you can have, you know, X instead of instead of the Y that you've demanded. Can you kind of go into how how that the difference between the decisions made by the COCOMs and the and the national grand strategy of the use of our f- fleet would would come into play? Yeah, the uh, um, the current unified command plan, you know, was established by the National Security Act in 1947, and you know, modified sequentially or subsequently by uh, Goldwater Nichols, but when the Navy had a lot of ships, say four or 500 ships, uh, the um, delegation of strategy to the individual regional COCOMs was not a problem. You know, we covered the world uh, and we had plenty to do it. As the uh, the Navy sh- has shrunk, the... Um, the COCOMs have their own responsibilities, and, and they're, they always react responsibly to their own responsibilities. In other words, their, their requests for uh, naval forces are not frivolous. They, you know, based on their strategy, their theater security cooperation plans, they're only asking for what they feel they need. The problem is, and this is kind of an acid test, you ask yourself, who decides why those naval forces are deploying, the why of it? Well, right now, in the way it has been, the why is defined by the COCOMs. The Navy doesn't do that why, or it's not supposed to. All it does is raise, train, and equip, right? In the middle, between providing forces and their use, at the local regional level, there is a gap. Where is the global strategy for using naval forces? And it's not just a matter of um, concentration of force at a decisive point. It is a matter of who decides how they're, what, what they're deploying for. Uh, and there, there is a gap. Uh, the COCOMs decide, uh, and that's problematic. When you had a lot of ships, that kind of got covered over. It, it didn't matter. But now that we're short on ships and we have a, another global uh, competitor, uh, that gap matters. There needs to be a global strategy for dealing with China and Russia, and there needs to be as a subset of that overall global strategy, there needs to be a global maritime strategy for figuring out where to put our chips, as it were, uh, in what areas, vice other areas. Because right now, the only thing that's happening is there is a global force management council, but all they're doing is uh, uh, distributing scarcity. They're not, you know, it's not strategic. I t- Bob work as a uh, former deputy secretary of defense tried to establish a supply side uh, process for, you know, the COCOMs where you only get what the Navy can supply sustainably. Uh, but that, that didn't work because there's, because of that gap in the middle, that strategic gap between the force provider, the Navy and the force users the COCOMs, uh, which is why I recommended that uh, uh, there be a staff inside DOD that does that. You know, one thing that's, that's come up on a regular basis in the years we've we've done MIDRATs is uh, three things. One is the, the the warping effects of the COCOMs. I I sometimes look at them as Competing salesmen, you know, every everything's the most important, everything's the best, everything's the most critical, and uh, they're they're all trying to get one buyer to to give them what they have. And the you know, 1986 Goldwater Nichols built back at the height of the Cold War, and also the fact that our Chief of Naval Operations is, in many regards, in some ways that you outline quite well in the article, sidelined. You know, you you're raising, training, and equipping. But uh, other people are putting the demands and stretching the forces, and he's kind of out of the loop in some regards. Now, for the first two, and 
I think, to a degree, and I'm not an expert on this, on the, in the third. For the COCOMs and, and Goldwater Nichols, that's going to require action in Congress. And I know there are some few people up on the Hill in both the House and the Senate who are interested in this, but there's not a critical mass yet. Um, and in the likely event, you, we can't get something to replace Goldwater Nichols if the argument can be made that it's no longer fit for purpose. Is there something that we could do with the roles and responsibilities of the Chief of Naval Operations, perhaps that additional department inside of DOD, that could better optimize kind of the unique requirements of uh, maintaining the capability and the readiness of a naval force compared to other parts in DOD? Yeah, the, uh, the anytime you try to go into the legislation, uh, you you start muddying the waters and, and incurring risks. Uh, again, Bob Work and I talked about this, and uh, what I came up with was this idea of creating a staff inside the uh, Office of Secretary of Defense because the joint st- you can't do it at the joint staff because the joint staff doesn't have uh, command authority. They can't tell people to go there shoot them. Uh, that goes directly from uh, the SecDef to the COCOMs. Um, the Navy, of course, doesn't have that authority either. Where the authority lies, the where the authority lies is with the uh, Secretary of Defense. So that to solve the problem quickly without having to go into legislation or a total reorganization is to establish a staff within uh, uh, the the Office of the Secretary of Defense. It can be an operational staff. They can direct naval forces. They have authority equal to the COCOM, so they can tell people no. They could. I mean, the Navy's tried a number of things, like the fleet – was it called the fleet um, readiness plan or wherever it was where we were. And, and then the thing that, that uh, uh, general Mattis, when he was uh, secretary of defense was trying where we would have these uh, surges kind of on demand surges that, that happened a couple of times, but all that seems to have fallen by the wayside and we're stuck with this, this uh, current situation. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe the solution is a, a grand staff, uh, but I, I'm, I'm always curious about what happens when you have such a, a uh, I, I, whether the force is going to think that that's another one of these layers that they don't need to deal with, or if that's a, a, a workable concept. Um, and I, I guess I'm a, kind of asking that of, of you. I mean, is this is have you talked to anybody about whether this it just looks like another layer of admin in, in the middle of stuff, or is it uh, is it a viable concept? Do you think? Well, again, uh, uh, Bob Work, who was Deputy Secretary of Defense, and I have talked this over quite a bit. And uh, uh, from his perspective, something like this could work. Uh, is, would it regard, be regarded as another layer? Well, you know, you run into the kind of the STRATCOM uh, thing where uh, they control certain things that uh, uh, are actually out in the – operating in the uh, – the COCOM regions. Uh, I think we've got enough experience with that in Special Operations Command and Transportation Command to, uh, uh, I, th- I think that it could be worked out. We, we The uh, the experiences uh, with those functional commands, I think, would uh, allow us to establish a staff uh, and maybe we have to call it a, a command, but uh, uh, a uh, you know call it what you want—a global uh, maritime command or uh, whatever—to uh, uh, distribute naval forces. They, you know, once the forces are distributed, they would then be allocated or assigned to the COCOMs to be used uh, not only as the COCOM desires, but in accordance with some national strategy too. But I. I, I don't think it would be another layer. Now, equally complicated, if you're looking inside of our our, our present funding construct, because it's, it's hard to find any momentum one way or another. Um, you know, with all the spending we've seen in the last year, I mean, it's clear that we're not 
fiscally constrained uh, to spend more on our Navy, but more uh, priority constrained. It's just simply not a priority, and that's a reality. And early on in the article, you talked about four options with, with dealing with part of the problem of what we have. And you know, we just got through talking about your final option, which is um, you know centrally managing uh, our, our, our navies from the Pentagon. And the third option is, is something that would be interesting that you could do almost in parallel with the other ones. And this is uh, this this argument's been going on since uh, I think Jefferson was was president, but that's you know building if 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 presence is important and presence is an ongoing naval mission, and we don't have enough ships in our present funding to do what we need to be done is another answer part of building more smaller less expensive ships that might not be the perfect warship at, on the high-end fight, but are better able to perform the presence mission that you need in order to deter war. Is is that that third option one that you think is a, a spent argument, or are there some advocates out there that are maybe getting some traction where we could join in that, that part of the conversation again with some vigor that we saw you know, almost a decade ago? Yeah, well, of course, I've I've written a number of articles uh, um, advocating just that uh, fl- forward flotillas, um, and uh, you know the the Navy. If you look at the uh, CNO NAV plan uh, that came out at at the end of or end of last year, I guess it was, um, kind of do it. Uh, but it's mostly uh, in the realm of unmanned vehicles. In other words, they're trying to proliferate platforms uh, by uh, developing unmanned systems. And I, I, you know, that has its place and it's a step forward, but I do think you need uh, uh, manned platforms. And will will the uh, new frigate do that? I don't know. I don't think we can buy enough of them uh, to to really get that done, uh, but maybe. Uh, but is there, uh, Admiral Joe Sestak, uh, he's retired admiral and a, a former congressman, uh, wrote an article in the Texas National Security Review a while back. You know, I don't agree with all, but he asserted that, well, we've already lost command of the sea because we're only in the South China Sea at China's sufferance. Well, I don't get, I don't necessarily agree with that, but he has a good point. Um, Let's go back to command of the sea. It consists of two parts, maintenance of command. In other words, keeping that concentration of force or keep broadly speaking our maritime superiority that nobody wants to challenge. And then the exercise. Now for the United States, isolated as we are by the Atlantic and Pacific oceans, uh, you know, exercise of command and maintenance of command are really uh, separated by these oceans. In other words, our home fleet, as it were, our all the ships that are in home waters undergoing repair or training and everything, that constitutes the bulk of the Navy. It's, uh, you know, even now I, we, we generally have about 100 ships forward deployed with another uh, 180 or so in home waters. So, you know, our, our dynamic has always been the forward fleets kind of uh, – are the first responders and maybe the tripwires, but then we, we surge forward uh, these naval forces from uh, home waters that are surgible. Uh, well, SESTEC con, con, uh, contends that uh, that is no longer viable. Things happen too fast forward and our uh, surge forces get forward, you know, there'll be a fate accompli that we can't undo. Therefore, he thinks that we need uh, kind of war-winning naval power stationed forward. If if you buy that argument, and I kind of do, uh, then you need these uh, powerful flotillas, not gazillion aircraft carriers or, or uh, Burks, but missile-based flotillas forward that can uh, clearly able to defeat or at least strategically disrupt any attempt by China or Russia to conduct aggression via the sea. 
uh, if you do that, um, 